You're listening to Tara Lynn's A Geek Saga podcast. This episode features audio from a discussion panel that was recorded at Ice and FireCon 2018. Well, thank you everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to the Phantom Panel, which originally had a much stronger title, which was like the different faces of the fandoms of Ice and Fire bridging the gap past, present, future, but that would not fit on this panel. So we had to really drastically um, shorten that. So my name is Anne. Um, maybe you also know me as YFC from somewhere, probably Twitter. And uh, so we're here today to discuss, not not talk about the books or the show, but to talk about the fandoms, the people in the fandoms, where they express themselves, uh, how they decide to express themselves, what might you want to be a more active participant in the fandom, that kind of thing. We really hope to have time for questions afterwards, but that's a pretty big panel, so <laughs> we'll try to be quick. So, first thing for all my beautiful guests, or more beautiful guests, uh, can you, each of you, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit more about yourselves, like when did you start reading the books? What was your first point of contact with the series when you get into the Song of Ice and Fire fandom proper? And what made you want to be a more active participant in the fandom? And maybe we can start by Jasmine. I'm Jeff. Oh, I'm Jasmine. There's not much core here, sorry. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> we know. Um, I started reading the books shortly at the end of season one, I think. I was like kind of resisting it, and then I, saw, I heard like the spoiler about Ned, and then I was like, oh, this seems interesting. So I got all the books and read them that summer. And then I really started getting into it. Probably 2012, I started listening to podcast of Ice and Fire was my first introduction. And then I found out about Ice and Fire Con from podcast of Ice and Fire, because Tara was on there. And yeah, that was around the time, 2013, when I really got into fandom, and then I started going to conventions and stalking George casually around the country. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I've always been into fandom, like Harry Potter was my first love, so I just really like dove in, because now I have like money to go places and do things. So that was my intro into fandom. Um, hi guys, I'm Tara. Uh, if you haven't seen me running around like crazy this weekend, then I don't know where you've been. <laughs> um, so uh, I started, I had a friend who was watching the show and um, he kept saying like, this show is really great, this show is really great and you should watch it. And then at one point he, you know, I was kind of putting it off and putting it off. Uh, this was like during season one and he finally mentioned that it was based on a book series. And at that point I said, okay, I'm going to read the books then um, and see what this is about. So that was, uh, I started reading them, it was like the fall of 2011 um, and I like blew through them in about a month. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, when and, and honestly like right away I jumped into the fandom stuff and, and even though I had been a fangirl of a whole lot of things, um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. We didn't have like internet until I was almost graduated from high school. Um, so I didn't really, even though I was into like X-Files and stuff, it was things, you know, I, I talked to my friends about it in person. I never was involved in online fandom. So Song of Ice and Fire was the first time I did get involved in online fandom. And I started with a uh, live journal. Um, I, I had a I had a live journal. I uh, was part of a community called Westeros Sorting, uh, and I also did some fan uh for the first couple of years. I was a fan, and then I ran out of free time to do that. Um, but uh, so yeah, and and the 2012, the summer of 2012 at DragonCon, um, I met some people online via a Game of Thrones like costuming group on Facebook, and. We did, there wasn't much uh, programming for Song of Ice Fire or Game of Thrones at, at multi genre conventions back then, so we decided that we were just going to make our own, and that is how this happened. I mean, we literally decided we were going to do it uh, over Labor Day weekend in 2012, and we, in less than a month, we had uh, secured a venue and and you know started planning everything. Um, and uh, I also, uh, I, I was definitely on the subreddit, and I still am, but I'm mostly a lurker. Uh, 
I've had bad Reddit experiences, not with the sub for this community, but uh, so yeah, I lurk a lot on Reddit, so I'm on there judging all of your feelings. Yeah. <laughs> Just not saying anything. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eliana. I'm the one probably being judged. <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I saying about myself? Introduction of how you found the fandom. Okay, the books I fun. found the fandom. Well, first I got into the series. Uh, yeah, uh, also in 2012, my college roommate and a bunch of people at school were all like, "Oh my god, you need to like get into the series. You would love it." And I was like, "Yeah, probably." And then so the week leading up to season two, my college roommate. And she finally sat me down. She was like, "We're gonna, we're gonna watch this," and we just crash course binge the entire series that week, right in time for season two. And after season two was done, I was like, "All right, I gotta know what keeps happening in the story. What happens next?" So I picked up the books. Um, that took me actually a long time to read. I finished it in 2013, partially because I was like, "Oh, uh, I'm gonna try and stretch out reading A Dance with Dragons because who knows when I'm gonna get." next book but then some of my friends um started talking about things i was like never mind i want to talk about things and i was already on reddit before um and i was like i want to go on the subreddit and see what people are saying so i just finished up the books and got involved um discussing with people on the subreddit but i had always kind of felt at home discussing things about fandom in general like my first fandom was sailor moon when i was like in my wee single digits and going on like with my dial up internet to like random ass fan circles and looking at people's fanfic and like drawings and things like that so fandom's just home hi i'm uh sam rixian uh, mallory and uh i got into the fandom in i want to say about 2007 one of my coworkers i worked at starbucks at the time he was like hey you should check out game of thrones and I was like, okay. And so I did. I went home, I bought the books, and I was like, this is pretty cool. And I remember rereading the first chapter like 15 times and being like, where did that guy go? What happened to that dude? Because um, he isn't mentioned again. And I went in and uh, talked to my coworker the next day, and I was like, man, I really like the Starks. And he just went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> smile. Well, you're going to have an interesting time. And uh, yeah, I've, um, I've always drawn. Um, the first fandom I got into was. Uh, uh, the Dragon Riders of Pern fandom. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It was very old. It was in like 2003, and it was like you would write a story and be awarded a dragon for how good it was, and it was made yeah. different colors. And uh, I did a lot of those drawings for dragons, and um, Pokemon has always been huge for me. Um, and when I got into Song of Ice and Fire in about 2007, it took me a while to actually break my way into the fandom. I was bored at work one day, and I was just like, I'm going to look up on YouTube some videos to listen to because I need stuff to look up and I need to know more about Targaryens and history and I need to catch up on everything. So that's kind of what I did from there is I just, uh, I wanna say like, brushed up my knowledge with podcasts and stuff. So that's kind of how I got into it. History of Westeros was the first one, Radio Westeros kind of cool. Yeah, sorry. I think I this sort of oh, my God. <laughs> 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 like like uh, I'm Scott uh, for the Davos Fingers podcast. Um, Story's interesting, I guess. Uh, I, I saw on a free HBO preview weekend, because I was not buying HBO at the time, uh, or since. Uh, I, <laughs> I, uh, I saw the last half of the very first episode of Game of Thrones, and was fascinated, and went, I believe it was the very next day, although that might just be a dramatic retelling, uh, went to a coworker of mine uh, and, and talked to her about it. Her name was Brooke. And uh, she said, I think literally, you know those are books, right? And I said, no. Um, and then uh, I went out and started reading them. And um, we kind of, she and I and, and our buddy Matt, uh, the third member of God's Fingers, just started kind of talking while we were at work on our Skype or whatever, just between the three of us. And there was no... <coughs> I'm, sh I'm certain we went to like the, you know, the Westeros boards and, and things, the forums, uh, to read up on things as we went. But um, we all were reading the books. Brooke had read them from when they came out in the '90s um, up till now, and um, we all caught up. And then we were all just kind of talking about it for a little over a year, I think. Uh, and then we said we're all going to do a reread. I'm like, well, if we're all rereading. Let's just 
let's get together and talk about it. And so, um, I, I don't, I mean, we've always we've said this quite a few times in the cast, I don't think we ever thought anyone would listen to us talk about it at all. It's a surprise to this day, really. But, um, but after that, I mean, it just kind of, I don't know if it's kind of the same, it sounds maybe it's kind of the same verb, but it's like a slow burn. I mean, with the fandom, you just kind of, you engage and then you see something else and then you engage in that and all of a sudden you're engaging in fucking everything. <laughs> and uh, so that's where I am now, I'm engaging as much as I can for the amount of time available to engage. Uh, it's just a balancing act. But, uh, so yeah, so first season of Game of Thrones, right then is when I got involved. Um, and then I've read it four or five times since. So that's why it's my story. Yeah, those are good, sorry. I probably sort of like everyone with season one of Game of Thrones. After the season had finished, I was about to start season two straight away. And like, I remember there's that scene, I think, at Dragon Soul with Stannis. And I got lost. I'm like, who are those people? I have no idea what's going on. So, as a good normal person, I Google, you know, trying to figure out who the characters are and not knowing those were books. And I stumbled onto the West Rose that are formed. And I spent hours reading that. So I discovered there was a fandom before I discovered, or at the same time, I discovered the old books. And I read a lot of the, I can't remember the name, but the very infamous thread there that is like, um, has been ongoing. It's the one thread where they're like, oh, the White Walkers aren't really good guys. The heresy, heresy. heresy thread. Yes, I started my, my, yes. I read the heresy thread before I ever read the books. Yeah. But I thought, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one way. But I thought, you know, if the, there's such an active, I'm not necessarily a big fantasy reader or fan, but I thought, oh, if there's such an active fandom around those books, there's got to be something to them. And that's, I started reading the books. Um, but I've got more questions for you guys. So, Jasmine, you're. As you said, you were one of the members of the Brotherhoods Without Banner, which is the OG A Song of Ice and Fire fan group. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit more what it's like and how you got in? Because, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, the BWB of the Brotherhood Without Banners, it's George's fan club. I think it started uh, at some kind in Philly. I'm not sure which one, and I doubt my husband will remember the name of it anyway. So basically, it's just a bunch of people that get together at cons, and they just hang out with George. And sometimes, and most of the time without George. Yeah. There's yeah. some dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> Ella dinosaurs. Real dragons. Real oh dragons. Real dragons. <laughs> Real dragons. There's my dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Whoever's watching this panel, like once we, once we put it online from the recording, is gonna be like, what are they talking about? <laughs> the dragon's in the back of the room, I swear. Okay, anyway, Jasmine, go on. <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, if you go on the Westeros, yeah, if you go on the Westeros um, forums, there's a section called Brother Without Banners. Had no idea what it was, I clicked on it, and I saw like, they basically plan parties for almost every single event con that George goes to. to all you have to do to go and become a member is just say, hey, I want to go to this party at this convention. And they'll be like, cool, you should come. And then that's pretty much it. Like you just have to go. And so we went in Spokane. We went to Worldcon 2014. And you get inducted. So you, we took a shot. We had to take a shot of vodka infused with yellow scorpion pepper in front of George. Oh. In a room full of people. I was in the front row, of course. I wanted George to see me. So that's it. So we are the free company of the fireworm. But like each year you get induct you know, people get inducted. It's just a fun, easy thing. Like there's like two rules. It's like be respectful and like don't get too drunk. It's like very like laissez faire. It's just a bunch of people that just love George and have been hanging out with him for like twenty years. And like, I don't know, it's just fun and he kinda of knows who I am now. <laughs> I have that. But yeah, pretty much anyone can go. If George is ever in your in your town or whatever, you can go see him. Go, because he's really cool. He loves meeting fans. Just don't ask him like the dumb question. <laughs> Just don't. But like, yeah, he's really chill. Like, definitely do it, because like, I didn't think in 2013 when I met him at Cat, Cat Clave in Gaithersburg, Maryland, that like, years later, 
I like he vaguely know who I am. So <laughs> that's that's my little fandom story. <laughs> and he knows who she is. <laughs> <laughs> and and Wu knows who she Wu yours is almost like. Yeah, so, so you guys know one degree separation. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Would you say like the dynamic has changed since you know 2013 when you know because they feel the fandom really exploded? Yeah, that's the one thing that's changed is George is like he has has to have security and like lines get longer and it's a little bit more. It's not as easy as it was when he was a nobody back in random con in 2009 and like he had like one fan so that's how we really got to know his fans and then if you look in the thank you section like a lot of hit the bwb members like podrick i think he's in the book i don't know there's a couple members that are characters and there's a couple members that are in the thank you section so he just appreciates people buying mcginnis if you see him around because that's his drink <laughs> yeah and i'm trying to give you guys tips respect for the guinness yeah so that's pretty much it it's just the fandom's grown so much you just kind of just take your opportunity and like Maybe try to stick out in your own way, like wear a cool kind of Westeros themed shirt, or we wear our uh, Ray on Martell shirts every time. He comments on them every time. <laughs> so yeah, just just like be yourself and like just you know say hi to George and don't don't ask the dumb questions. That's pretty much the, the number one rule. Thank you. Um, actually, Tara, you already answered a lot of the questions there specifically for you in your introduction. Like you know, you told us, you told us. How you, you started creating that com, mm -hmm. but can you be like because we're really that that balance on there about the nitty gritty of being a fan, you mm -hmm. know? So, like, can you tell us a little bit more what it took for you to go from just being a con added convention goer to really like creating that things from the ground? So the funny story is, I actually. Um, <laughs> Dragon Con 2012, when I met these people and we then right after decided to do this in FireCon, uh, that was only my second convention. Wow. Um, my first one was Star Wars Celebration 5 in Orlando in 2010. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I really like jumped into it, but I had years of event planning experience. Um, I like did a lot of stuff in college. Uh, I, I ran... Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the giant monologues, but like mm -hmm. they did college, they did college campaigns uh, back. I don't know if they still do them, but back then they did. I'm not gonna tell you when I'm old, um, but back then they did, and I ran that at my college for a couple years. I was um, the social chair, which means I planned all the events for my sorority. So I had a, a lot of experience with doing this stuff and, and finding venues and dealing with that. I also had a finance background. Um, so that helped in terms of being able to budget and whatnot. And, and honestly, like that's the nitty gritty of it. That's the stuff that nobody really sees uh, except for the people who are directly involved. And I mean, honestly, even our volunteers, like they don't, they don't know what, they don't deal with our budgets. <laughs> God help them. <laughs> like I wouldn't put that on anybody. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to do it. Um, but so, so yeah, I, I actually wasn't really an avid convention goer, but I, like I, I did have event planning experience and I wanted this to happen and, you know, it was a struggle. Um, we were really small our first few years and we, you know, we don't do this for the money. Um, I, I just, I honestly can't imagine doing it for the money, uh, cause it, I feel like it's, I don't know, it, there's something to it when you're not just trying to make a buck off of uh, some actor autographs or whatever mm -hmm. um and and so yeah i i the, we've grown very very slowly but generally steadily um you know changing locations uh this is our first year at deer creek so that's always a big uh Big to do, uh, as you guys might have noticed, there were issues with the sound system, um, which is brand new, and uh, I still haven't set up the sound system in the room next door because I've been running around like crazy. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a lot of work, but um, and and like I said earlier, like I don't have time to be involved in the online fandom, and this is kind of why. But I. I enjoy the in-person stuff so much more because I feel like people are kinder to each other in person than they are online. And that's that's kind of like across the board. Uh, but you know, it, it's just, 
it's harder to be an asshole when you're <laughs> when you're like standing face to face with someone talking. So yeah, but uh, I totally, I totally. But I guess to make your fandom grow, like you need to sort of rely on the, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. the publicity that involving yourself online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's like, how do you like? How do well, you deal with that? <laughs> um, I don't even know if some platforms. You know, like some platforms are not not real like outsiders who arrive and be like, oh, check out my stuff. So yeah. obviously, Tyson Farrakhan, like people don't see you advertising the con that way. But it's like, how, you know, how do you do that transition? Well, I mean, we've always advertised online. Um, when when we first started, it was we, we did post on the subreddit um, on both subreddits, Game of Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire. Um, back then, there weren't quite so many rules on these subreddits. Understandably so, they've had to um, put a lot of them up since you know 2012. It's it's been a long uh, six years. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so, so like we we did absolutely post about it on. The subreddit we posted about I, I mean back then the live journal community was still going so like I, I posted about it in the Westeros sorting live journal and uh and in the Game of Thrones live journal community too I, I think um and of course we've always had like a Facebook page we've we posted in the costuming groups anyone that we could find um but on it like back then it was and we, we've always had a Twitter and stuff uh, Chloe runs uh our Twitter and Instagram now um and honestly, like I don't know what I would do without her because like I can't I can't do it all. I can barely keep up with the website and the Facebook, and that's like all I have to do online for us. Um, so so yeah, if you're if you're talking to somebody on Twitter or Instagram, it's 99% of the time it's Chloe. Um, so she's been really really great, especially with boosting our Twitter because uh, honestly, it sat and didn't have much you know going on it except for basic news when I could throw something up for the longest time. Um, yeah, it's very engaging. Yes, yeah. So so having somebody who's pretty much that's like her, her big main job throughout the year is is a must. Uh, and um, I'm trying to think uh, where else we might have shared stuff. But, and, and also at cons. Like I, I know I said I wasn't a big convention goer, you know, before Ice and Fire Con, but like I already had plans to go to several conventions when we started planning this one. So, you know, we printed out flyers and we handed them out to, you know, people we saw in Game of Thrones costumes. We, I, I'm, I've also been um, a panelist. Uh, like I, I did some public speaking in and after school. Um, so I've, I've used that experience uh, along with just general kind of knowledge to, you know, get on panels at a ton of conventions. And every time I'm on a panel, I talk about this convention, of course. Uh, I mean, if it's a Game of Thrones song, Ice and Fire panel, uh, I usually try to keep it on the keep, keep keep it back if it's you know or a Harry Potter or something. But uh, but yeah, so so and and honestly, like a word of mouth is definitely you for the longest time was like the, our biggest you know game because uh, once people start going to conventions, I it. it becomes a thing that you do. Not not for everybody, but there's a lot of people at this convention who came to Ice and Fire Con 2013. It was their first convention ever, and now I see them four or five times a year at other conventions. So. <laughs> um, you were talking a bit in the direction about Reddit, and we have Eliana, our two. Can you tell us a little bit more how you went from being a Reddit user to being a Reddit moderator? Yeah, so the thing for me about fandom is that it's at its core, it's a community. It's people talking to each other, exchanging ideas, building off of one another's ideas and just like coming together about all of these. And so I was engaged in the community from that perspective. And I guess when I could like, I would try and help people like find resources when they could. Before we had like the auto moderator doing Q and A Wednesday, I was running like a thread on every Tuesday, being like I called it Small Talk Tuesday. Because sometimes people, especially back then when the series was newer and picking up speed, well, it wasn't newer. Like the, the show was newer, and like it, it was picking up speed, right? And people would sometimes come in and they'd see like all these like really intense theories and would feel intimidated to ask 
ask any questions that they weren't really sure or needed clarification on. So that still happens to me. Yeah, <laughs> running running those threads um, and helping point people to resources, inviting other people to come in, um, as well as. I wanted to connect with people in real life. I don't, I for some reason didn't know that this con existed, but also like had smaller budgets and funds and stuff in my life. And um, I also started organizing like a reread book club with people in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And I was like, hey, internet strangers, let's <laughs> hang out. And you know, uh, first we met at like a cafe somewhere and then it turns out you know, the DC thing to do is to get brunch. So we would just get brunch on the weekends and hang out and talk about the books. And yeah, I just like participated in the community. And one day they approached me and were like, hey, do you want to be a moderator? And uh, at first I was like kind of freaked out. I was like, uh, no, people are scary uh, when they're on the internet in real life. They're perfectly wonderful and fantastic. And I would love to be your friend, but you know, um, like I said, uh, being having a community where people can engage with one another was something that was really important to me. And I had known Jeff by this time, and I was like, what should I do? And he was like, well, if you want to have a community where people are engaging with one another, if you want to protect something like that, this gives you the opportunity to help um, enforce that, help, help people continue to build up one another. And so as you browse things, you know, you just you just take care of things as you see it. It's just how it is. Just live your life and yeah, so garden. Yeah. You know, we are we are the watchers on the walls, but not that's not actually that's not who we are. That's not the first site. No. <laughs> don't don't use what I no. said. Yeah. Never, never mind. We uh we serve we guard the I don't know, something. Insert a cool metaphor here from the books. Well, like a Brazilian. Uh, but yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Tell Cersei, I want her to know it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really interesting what you're saying about like sort of molding or guarding what you want the community, the red, your reading community to be, like to make you grow into something less toxic because there's a lot. Obviously, every online community has a very strong potential to become toxic, and your job is to like try as much as you can to prevent that. So, it's like, do you have any like you've been working on that for years? Any action for the future to like try to help the Reddit, the Southwest Empire community, be more I know, inclusive, nicer? I think we've done a fairly decent job of that right now. We're very explicit about these are our rules and. Please live by them. Don't insult real people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fictional characters are for your game, but like just keep it, keep things civil. I think it's a big part of it is just being empathetic and understanding constantly that there is someone else on the other side of that username, whether or not you agree with them, and understanding that sometimes when people will get heated, ultimately it's because they want their perspective to be understood and to be heard, and just giving people that opportunity, airing out and being like, yes. We've heard you, but just please remember, you know, there's someone else on the other side. You can disagree, and people disagree all the time, but just do it civilly, because in otherwise, if you're not, what you're doing is you're shutting down conversations, you're making it actually diff more difficult to get closer to insights and, or truth or whatever when you stop talking about ideas and start attacking each other. And is there any, like, things that you still feel like you want to tackle one in the future? I think what we're trying to see is, um, you know, the engagement that people have with the community and the, and the energy, to some extent, peters off. It peters off a little in the off season when there isn't a show and when there's just not new material in general. So obviously we are looking at figuring out how we're going to um, respond to and what sort of activities or events we would have in response to the release of Fire and Blood Volume 1. Um, but also trying to figure out how we can continue keeping like a sustained community conversation as the show comes to a close and without really having an idea of when to expect the winds of winter. 
So how can we continue to keep people talking with one another? Community. Yeah. 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 We're, we're going to switch to become a subreddit about the show Community. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. That was, so you picked a defunct show. <laughs> <laughs> something else entirely. Try something else. Try something new. Yeah. Guarded it here. Yes. <laughs> and one last thing, you know, like that is not really new, but he's less than one year old. Uh, last year, I <coughs> saw your new podcast, YouTube channel, like Mr. Smog, but with the other mods. And so, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like, oh, that was something totally new. I mean, I, because you had all done your own personal essays, but that was like, all of you coming together to create that podcast or YouTube channel to do something together like how uh, did that happen? Yeah, so it is now. It now has been a year since we did it. And I think part of it was I don't know, the best stops had come out recently. We were like, oh it'd be fun to like have a more in-depth discussion about this. But also there are a couple of goals that we had for the podcast, right? It's not like, yeah, a lot of us put out our own content and essays, but you'll notice like that in the subreddit highlights, we almost never talk about our own, mm -hmm. like we're never sharing our own work because we want it to be something that highlights all the great stuff that's coming out of this community. Like one of the benefits of Reddit is it's a watering hole where people like can come and be like, oh, I brought this thing, um, or I made this thing, I made these, please come see it. And I. I think ultimately people come there and discuss these things because they want to be able to connect with one another. So being able to, um, again, engage with that content in a podcast helps people feel like someone's seeing it and they are making connections, but also uh, there is that broader uh, A Song of Ice and Fire community outside of the subreddit. And a lot of people uh, listen to podcasts as they're going and being able to use that podcast to um, showcase the great work that people are doing to our own community um, and also as a way of showing people hey this is what this is great content that people want to talk about and hopefully um, incentivizing people to feel like they want to make their own content and have people respond to that and then also showing to the outer broader a song of ice and <coughs> community of people who listen to podcasts that hey look at all this awesome stuff that's going on here um, we'd love for you to join. And do you think like you brought like and you have and I'm sure you have numbers uh, somewhat in like you feel like you brought in new people. I because I religiously listen to your podcast, but I'm still like really afraid of this subreddit. Mm -hmm. But I think that so the fact of the matter is with Reddit in any way, like with the statistics of everything is and this is true of any subreddit and across the entire site you're going to have more people lurking, um, just like looking at the site, browsing through it, and um, just visiting and seeing it and um, absorbing information. And then after that, the next one is you have people who are upvoting or downvoting on the information. And then you, next you have the people who are actually engaging in conversations. And there's always only very a small percentage of that larger amount, right? We've pulled numbers on that, but we, don't have the tools because Reddit doesn't have that functionality for us to understand like here are people who are signing up because of this. We we go by anecdotes. But I've met people here at this convention who are like, hey, I like actually started going to the subreddit and I'm like looking at all this cool stuff that people are making because we heard about it on Maester Monthly and we're like, wow, there's something really awesome going on in there and um, I'd like I'd love to see what people are saying. So I do think that happens, but I just we don't have literally the social media tools to be able to track that. No, no, but it was more like, oh, yeah, to people like you can say goal achieved. Like that, that was one goal that you had. Yeah. Set for yourself. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, I have a hard time transitioning from one person talking to the next. But You're since good. we're talking about podcasts, Scott, uh, one thing that is stands out about you know your podcast. Is that you say? I want to say podcast only. Like you did not, you did not go to YouTube because there's we don't have anyone from the YouTube community really here. But oh, you know, there's a lot of 
usually going on YouTube really helps anyone who's broke. So why do you make that choice? I'm glad not being on YouTube is what stands out about the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But within its place in the community, which is uh, the, yeah, you, teasing, you know, yeah, you have yeah, the I'm best. Just teasing, yeah. That's uh, what we said jokes also. <laughs> it's mostly Matt. Get them one or two here and there. Uh, the choice not to go on YouTube was, this is sad. Uh, it wasn't a choice. Um, we, we worked at a certain audio format and we found that converting those audio files to a video file that YouTube would accept was very time consuming. And we're lazy, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you know, like we, we've got families and jobs and we're like, we're just not gonna prioritize that. And you know, this is, it's a really weird thing to talk about, but like, kind of like I said in the introduction, like uh, we didn't ever expect anyone to listen. Um, we have started a Patreon now, so we're monetizing that in some way, and very much appreciation for those that helped us. But, but it wasn't it wasn't ever the goal was never like let's conquer the world with this thing. We got to get on all these different formats and make sure everyone can hear our message. And and we just found like you know what, YouTube is cool. It's a lot of extra effort for us, and probably it doesn't have to be. We took a ton to figure out how to do it right, maybe. But it's a lot of extra effort for us, and if people want to find us, they'll find, they'll find our message another way. Yeah. And um, so we miss out on some people. I, I've, I've talked to people before that are like, why are you on YouTube? That's, that's where I listen to everything. I'm like, damn, like, we should get on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we are, we have a few episodes yeah. there because we did try for a little while. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but the answer is, is sad. It's, we're busy and we decided not to prioritize it. Yeah, hey, it's not. Because you guys are, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't really know how active you are on Facebook, but I know on Twitter, it's like you are, I don't know every single podcast, but of the podcast I listen to and I follow, you're the one who is the most engaging with this community. Like you're always there, you're always talking to people, your listeners, people then your cats are, like they're really like from the standpoint of it. Twitter user, I really feel like I'm part of your community, although you're just like, your podcast platform is not a place where I can interact, you come somewhere else, and yeah. we feel like we're a community around your podcast. That's the, that's the really weird thing about our format, um, is, I don't think I'm breaking any news, but it's just the two of us talking now, three, when, when we had Brooke, and, uh, and there is no way to interact directly with people when it's happening, right, and that's, in a way, it's very frustrating because we want to know what everyone thinks and what they're thinking of our thoughts. It's like, ah, I wish we, you know, we knew. And so, and Matt, just to give credit where it's due credit, Matt monitors our Twitter most of the time. If you're on Twitter, it's usually him. I try to put my little like dash S if it's me. Um, but uh, he does an amazing job managing that, and I usually handle most of the email. But uh, we love hearing from everybody. We love it. It's it's our only interaction we get. Eliana's talking about like the sense of community and interacting and trying to like garden that. We just want some shit to grow. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't um, think so. All right. Okay. Um, shit is the fertilizer. Um, <laughs> so like any interaction we get is just it's. Uh, sometimes I think people don't believe it when we say it, but like we love it. Like we just we want more of that. And so coming to things like this, where we get to meet a handful of people that that know about the podcast and listen, and just can exchange some some thoughts and meet people is just. Other than just an ego boost, which I admit occurs, uh, it's just the, the exact kind of thing we want is to be able to interact with people. Which is we don't get that in our format, unfortunately, right? So, yeah, did I answer your question at all. Yeah, no, <laughs> you were perfect, and you know, it's like I'm it's what I looking at the time. I'm like, okay, oh my god, I'm late. There's yeah. Uh, all right, I'm sorry. It's okay. Let's go. Let's you. So you're beautiful. Fan artist here at that table, which is you can pretty much you know you can create your art and keep it for yourself, and you have to make that conscious decision to put it online, putting it out there. So I was wondering, like, as a fan artist, mm -hmm. how do you feel? How do you decide to interact with the fandom? Mm -hmm. um, where I mean, like, where you post, but where you like posting, where you feel like you really have, feel a sense of community around your art. And also, you told me 
I'm drawing all the questions right now. Uh, that uh, you know, how you how does your work interlate with other people's theories or essays? Because you told me you worked around that a lot too. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what I do. Um, it's just like when I draw stuff for the fandom, it's just to make people happy. Like nobody needs a drawing of Garth Grinch hands, but I did it because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> we and, all um, we like, did that. I mean, like I just like I have sitting at my table. If you guys want to come by the vendor room and see me, I have the drawing of Rhaegar that says. Um, anyway, here's a song of Ice and Fire, which <laughs> you know. It's, um, so I just do things to try to make people happy, to try to make people laugh, uh, to dress people up. Like you guys probably know me from this shirt, the North Remembers, that's pretty much how I'm known on the internet right now. I interact a lot on Twitter um, and Instagram to in answer your question. Like there's a huge, if you guys are in this room right now and you are on Twitter and you love A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones, you need to get on it right now and just get into our threads because your life will never be the same. You will go to the bathroom and come out of the bathroom and you will look at your phone and you will have 99 plus notifications and you're like, what did I say? What did I say? I have no idea. But um, I really like that sense of the fandom in the community and just being able to mess around with people, to be able to make silly drawings for them. As far as my purpose as an artist, like um, what I really like to do is I like to illustrate things that George writes about that maybe get um, glazed over or we don't really have definitive stats like vague art. What color is Vagar? Okay, Aziz says she's red. Uh, LML says she's white. <laughs> so I went with white with red accents. We covered the board. Um, but like <laughs> things like that that are kind of like subjective and um, that don't really matter. Like those are the things I'm thinking about. I'm like, why do the dragons only have two wings? And I know that George answered this whole thing about it. So I've accepted that and gone past it. But um, I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, if these dragons were real, how would their scales go and how would their um, how would dire wolves work in reality? So things like that. Um, I try to think about the land when I'm painting. I put a lot of symbolism into my work, if you're familiar with it. Um, and I try to just like convey what George was trying to convey or whatever, um, whoever I'm working with, an essay writer. Like I've done a couple um, slides for Joe Magician. He's another Reddit moderator. If you guys don't know him, he's a great dude. Um, he just started up his YouTube channel and um, I did like a little video bump intro for him and some slides But just being able to do simple like drawings that take me like 30 minutes And then he's like super happy for like a month and then we get to create something and put it on YouTube It's super fun man. Like I just like being asked to do things and being involved and just being here like getting to meet all you guys It's just awesome and um, like uh, Bringing the work to life is really the point of what I'm trying to say and getting lost in words. But yeah, um, that's kind of a cool thing to do. Like, um, I mean, it is really a uplifting message to hear all of you saying, well, not necessarily the reason why I got involved in the fandom, but pretty soon one of the things I wanted was to make the community happy, to make us closer together, to I like, feel like a family, and that's really hard to harm. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what else? sometimes, from an outsider's point of view, you can think, I mean, maybe not in every part of the community, but like, oh, those people are in it for the money. And I've heard people say that about other people. And I don't think, like, I don't think you can, if it's only for the money, like, you don't put in that much effort. Like, it's really amazing if you can end up having a little bit of money for, but you're already compensated for all of the work that you put into it in the first place. Yeah. But it's like, no, we really, like, over time, they need to get ourselves just to feel like a sense of community and yeah. Do you want to say something? Of course not. Honestly, like if somebody is in it for the money and the money alone, I don't think the amount of work is worth it. Like, nope. I, then that's kind of. I guess I didn't say that really well earlier when I was saying, you know, I, I you know, I do not do this for the money. I never went in it for the money. There is no money, by the way. Like we, we you know, we do this at, you know we're not for profit whatever but um and, and and also with you like the amount of the amount of work you put into anything like fandom wise i think like it has to it has to come from a place of of love like i do this because um like you guys are my family so <laughs> no no i definitely but and maybe it's mostly around youtubers but with I mean, I think anyone in that room has already heard at some point like that toxic idea that, oh, they're doing that for the money. They're making all that big YouTube money. By the way, there's no big YouTube money no, there's not. either. Uh, 
but yeah, like you hear that, like oh, they don't even really like the books. They just, you know, they just do that for the money. And no, that's that's what I want to say with that panel. That's yeah. what. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, and. Ooh, I'm sorry, Jasmine. I, I sort of that is it's fine. I mean, we knew this panel was gonna be like we could have had like a four hour panel like going yes. to each. Next year we're coming back. In part two, we're in four hours. <laughs> but I mean, I guess we could maybe quickly say like you know with the advent of Fire and Blood and the five HBO series and please come T Wow and Dream Spring. Where do we see the fandom going? Just me. Besides do crazy. See, do you see like amusement <laughs> parks like Harry Potter? Like where do you see like, I don't know, would I like a Westeros amusement park? Would it be cool? Yeah, but I don't know if it would. Westeros land? I, see I was going to say Westeros world. <laughs> yes, Westeros world. <laughs> and then everyone died. So yeah, do you have any ideas where you think the fan's going to go? Or if it, I mean, obviously it's going to keep growing because my coworkers are coming up to me talking about the show. They're like, like oh, what's this show? Oh, okay. So yeah, just it's a quick question. I think the Twitter is popping. Sorry, that was a terrible sentence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get on Twitter, please. Talk to me. Like, talk to all of us. We will talk to you. We see you, as Eliana says. We have no lives. Yeah, we, we just are on our phones. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, Scott. About where the fandom's going? Mm -hmm. uh, I, this is. I don't know. I don't know why it's always felt a little unique to me, um, and maybe it's just because of where, where technology has allowed people to go while these novels have been written. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the resources available to create these communities is different than it's ever been in the process of a great work like this being made, and so the fact that it's taken so long for some of them to come out has allowed that community to cultivate. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I get a little scared, right? When, when everything finishes, and HBO may, might never let it finish, nope. like Star Wars. Nope. Um, but when the books at least finish, which is you know what most of what we do, um, I worry a little bit, you know, about like what not what will happen with podcasts, which is like end or whatever. But you know, like, will people still want to talk about these forever? Mm -hmm. And I think they will. I think you know, like the volume will go down. But I think there are always going to be people. These books are fantastic. Assuming he doesn't, you know, <laughs> struggle with the last two. The books are fantastic, and people are going to want to talk about them forever. People still talk about Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings has been around forever, and people still talk about it all the time. And I think this work, similarly, will, will last forever. I think the volume will go down eventually. The, you know, blooms fall off roses all the time, but um, there are always, there are new readers being born every day. Uh, I have two children that will read it eventually, and eventually listen to my podcast when they're God, hopefully in their 20s. <laughs> and, and there will always be new people coming to that content. And so growing, I don't know. I just hope it's always there for them to come back to an experience for new people. Well said, Thanks. I guess. This will be, we'll have to tap, close. I don't know how to say it. End it here? Yeah, we'll have to end it here since we have another panel coming up soon. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming out and talking about all your interesting little pieces of the fandom, putting it in. We appreciate it, thanks. Yeah. Thank you.